Second area, we must strengthen the global framework against transnational organised crime. Any game without rules will soon descend into chaos. Fortunately, in fighting transnational organised crime, the rules do exist. In fact, an entire global legal framework exists. First of all, we have the drug control conventions, three of them in all. And in this region, the states of the region are reasonably uh, well signed up to them, well ratified on them, and have laws in place that are delivering the precepts of those conventions down onto the ground. Next, we have the UN Convention Against Corruption, the UNCAC, as they call it, which is a robust instrument and, in terms of transnational organized crime, has a very important uh, asset recovery seizure uh, provision in it, which allows us then, if done effectively, to target the profits, something that was mentioned by the last speaker. We have the 16 instruments on counter-terrorism. And as, uh, by way of an example of the sort of thing that we do, in UNODC, um, we assist the countries, and we've had some significant success in the Pacific, we assist countries to, uh, to ratify those conventions or accede to them, and then develop the laws to implement greater degree of uh, cooperation, especially in, in the criminal justice sector. This brings me squarely to the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. This convention, was adopted, as I mentioned earlier, 10 years ago in Palermo, Italy. It really is a 21st century solution to a 21st century problem. Yet, unfortunately, as many as one third of the countries on the planet have not signed up to it yet. Implement implementation is patchy, and there is no review mechanism like there is for the Convention on Corruption. So, in sum on response number two, we need to do more to build on the excellent framework that we have in the UNTOC. Let's move on now to the third, which is the thickest and, and most meaty of the five proposals. <clears throat> Friends, I think with all due respect to all that we're doing and all that we're trying to do and all that we know and all that we're trying to understand, I think our response needs to sharpen up. We must think afresh and we must act anew. The first way of thinking afresh is to pay attention to tackling demand. And I think we all recognize that there are many who are involved in the transnational organized crime markets, especially at the bottom of the pile, who consider that they have very little to lose. In fact, if you look at the choices that many people make, um, again, uh, talking about um, what was shared this morning on heroin, um, a lot of people are trafficking the product because they're desperate for money. They have massive gambling debts or they're in, in obligo to some other uh, system and that is where the players pounce. <clears throat> some people are desperately poor and they contribute to global crime because they have few alternative options available to them. However, there is another group of people with quite a lot to lose if they are found to be operating outside the law. And these are the people who operate on the illicit side of the same markets. Not so much drugs, because that by definition is illicit, but there are many other markets that there's a gray zone that we need to, to help to clarify. So here's the basic argument. Because there is often widespread mingling of licit and illicit markets, we need to enhance the regulation and accountability in illicit commerce in order to undermine demand for illicit goods and services. Now, if you think this sounds naive, Consider how swiftly the demand for legitimate origin certificates has started to influence the sourcing of goods and services in the major consumer markets of the world. It is often precisely the lack of clarity about origins that allows otherwise honest buyers, including commercial firms, to purchase merchandise illicitly or to, mer to purchase products which have been produced by trafficked hands. Here are a few encouraging examples of what I mean. I'm not going to read them for you, but uh, just to give you a sense of the kind of things that are... We've got three girls in our family, uh, three daughters. And five years ago, they were the ones that were asking me, Dad, do you know about traffic-free chocolate? Do you know about free trade, free, uh, fair trade? Um, and what about, the, 
What about the voluntary certification of wood? Aren't you, did, didn't you say you were working on, on, on trying to, to counteract illicit logging and so forth? These are things that consumers are talking about in countries that have the purchasing power to make a difference. Of relevance to our region, in 2008, Unilever pledged to purchase all palm oil from certified sustainable sources by the year 2015. Look, this, this approach is not a panacea, uh, but it, I think it will help to reduce demand for a lot of the, the contraband. This is something that was also mentioned this morning uh, uh, by Simon Overland, the importance of understanding the market. And this is the second way that we should be thinking afresh. We need to realize that law enforcement, while important, is not the only solution. Now here was a senior law enforcement officer saying that. And I think that's a, uh, it, that, that it's, 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 it's very, very refreshing to, to observe that broad pers broadness of perspective. In dealing with transnational organized crime, law enforcement has been the traditional response. But we need to make a distinction between the cartels and the markets. Law enforcement works well against organized crime groups. I don't need to tell uh, you this. You, you are an audience of, uh, of discernment, especially in this particular area. And we must continue to exploit the openings for disruption which come when transnational organized groups outsource their logistical operations as part of the globalization process. Sometimes we can benefit from that too. More than this, and despite the huge obstacles we face in this technologically empowered age, we need to continue to deny criminals access to secure communications in order to disrupt their operations as well. And more than this even, we need to go after their profit, as I've said before, which often, even in these days, still has to be physically moved from A to B and laundered through banking systems. But doing all of this necessary work alone will not stop illicit activities if the underlying markets remain unaddressed. Such markets these days also include the army of white collar criminals. This is something <clears throat> that Bill Hughes referred to at least three times in his presentation. The professional money launderers and the lawyers and accountants, realtors and bankers who do the cover-ups and launder the proceeds of crime. Some people, he referred to them I think as clean skins. Some people have even argued that the rise of the corrupt professional is in and of itself a major driver of the illicit markets. Therefore, to conclude on thinking afresh, the breakup of criminal groups on its own will not work because people who are arrested will be immediately replaced. We need therefore to disrupt the markets. We need to do this as if we understand we are doing this. Let me talk a little bit about acting anew. To promote, we talk a lot about transnational organized crime. How about transnational organized justice as a concept? Have a look at this slide, please. Have a look at the left side. Effectively, that's them. The right side, generally, is us. Our style of working hands over advantage to transnational organized crime groups. There are many things that we can do to work smarter, mainly by correcting our action in the right-hand column. I was hoping, I'm not sure if any of the three presenters that were speaking in the plenary sessions are here uh, to, to right now, I, I, I'm not sure, but uh, because there are a couple of observations I wanted to make. Um, <clears throat> the first is that Mr. Overland, um, he was saying that uh, all of this makes the transnational organized crime group sound inevitably um, destined for uh, victory. Um, but in reality, they're a lot less organized. They're not, the, in fact, quite often disorganized groups. And that's true. But still, we've seen these, these trends outsmart us over and over. That's the first point I'd like to make. Second point, um, with regard to what Steve uh, Martinez was saying, he drew attention to the silo mentality in the stovepipe information sharing approach. Yes. So, I mean, I think this is cross-validation of what he was saying. But the third point I was going to reserve for uh, uh, Mr. Hughes from SOCA. I, I don't know, is he? Right, I have a question for you, sir, if I may. Um, we've been looking, at, many of us across the planet have been looking at uh, SOCA and ENSYS, in fact, years earlier, um, as, as models of how um, to uh, organize 
cross transagency cooperation. And it'd be useful at some point, if you have a chance, and perhaps um, uh, after my presentation, to, to share your thoughts on what SOCA has been able to find out and learn about bridging those gaps, about trying to deal with some of these, some of these problems out of, out of interest. Nearing the end. I'd now like to put on screen a very simple diagram to talk a little bit about the work that we do. Essentially, our work on rule of law issues is focusing on things illicit, on governance, and criminal justice in these areas. I had intended to talk to you a little bit about the work that we're doing to counter human trafficking, but I suspect uh, that we don't have enough time for that. So I shall just move on to the fourth of the, of, uh, of the, of the points. I think Mr. Hughes talked about joined up approaches. He used that word uh, three or four times during his presentation. Um, essentially, far too often we witness the compulsion in the face of clear transboundary challenges to return to the safe and familiar sur surroundings of state sovereignty. To a degree, this is understandable. Law enforcement and the rendering of justice are central to the exercise of sovereignty. But working this way means that crime control stays trapped within borders, and the groups that oppose us have the advantage of operating in a borderless world. In some cases, they are actually working the system at borders to, to serve as a source of revenue. So we have a paradox. By seeking to protect their formal sovereignty, their formal sovereignty, flags, anthems, and so forth, states may actually be sacrificing their effective sovereignty. I think that our talk to report demonstrates that since crime has gone global, national responses are completely inadequate. At present, I believe, and this is, um, uh, Mr. Martinez was saying that he had lots of examples of lots of cooperation, so have I, but in general, at present, I believe that a multilateral response to transnational organized crime is still massively underdeveloped and massively underutilized. Many years ago, I came across a phrase, not my own, but I use it shamelessly whenever I have an opportunity to address an audience such as this. Simple phrase. It takes a network to defeat a network. Last point. Simple. We need to get out there and beat the drum. We need to be clear in our vision. We need to communicate a sense of urgency. And we need to stay on message each time and every time the microphone is presented in front of our faces. And the message, or at least my sense of what they ought to be, are contained in the four preceding points. I thank you for the invitation. I thank you for your attention. And I wish the remainder of this uh, conference every success. Thank you all.